Hello everybody and welcome to the MBS Show Reviews. This is James Cork and with me I have Norman Sanso. You got bits. <sighs> and awesome brony reviewer Silverquill. I am not an animal. I am a hippogriff. Oh wait. <laughs> well, the technical term is mythical creature. So, yeah, you are not an animal indeed. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I think I can be a little bit of both. But you're too majestic to be an animal, come on. I am a proof that natural selection is a lie. <laughs> you're a proof that love knows no bounds. Uh, like, what is the, 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 like, a lion with a, with an eagle, it can kind of get, but an eagle with a horse? Oh, How do you? Actually, a hippogriff is when a, when a griffin and a horse get it on. Bam, chicka, bam, bam. Ah! Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, well, okay, well, you know so, what? With all those, the, all those slash fix and all that, I'm surprised there are no more, not more, uh, hippogriffs around. <laughs> that's the thing. No one, uh, no one does the research on these things. All these, they look at my character and all they see is the beak. And I say, behold the dark side of my moon. I am a horse flank. <laughs> it's there a, I say, a... <laughs> I am a horse's. That's not a word. Uh, 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 uh. No, you have to admit it's a very good looking beak <laughs> <laughs> so the rails are over there guys I think we jumped them like a f couple of minutes ago <laughs> we already started off the rails here but we're going to be reviewing episode 8 of season 5 of MLP FIM uh, overall episode 99 titled The Lost Treasure of Griffonstone, written by Amy Keaton Rogers, with storyboard by Jen Debro and Mike Meyer. And this episode is probably the... Okay, this is the first episode of the of Season 5 that is not the two-parter premiere that takes advantage of the newfound map that appeared on Twilight Sparkle's castle. And as some of us were hoping to see it actually takes advantage of it. Because the map summons Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash to go to the kingdom of Griffinstone to solve a friendship problem. What happens after that is an endless barrage of story, the comeback of a character that people wanted to see again, and enough action to feel a Zack Snyder movie. <laughs> so, guys, what do you make of this episode? I mean, I, this is probably one of those episodes that had little to no hype at all, Yet it it got some of the best ratings of this season so far. I was like, people saw this episode more than uh, the the Discord episode, and for an episode to trample the Lord of Chaos, it really has to have something in it. So what what do you think of this one? I'll say that I am one of the few fans who wasn't really excited to see Gilda again. And when they said they're going to the Griffin Empire, it's like okay, we'll we'll probably see her again. For me, Gilda was. I kind of like her as the friend that got away. That mm -hmm. she just, because of her own faults, she can't, uh, she couldn't mend the gap with her and Rainbow, and you can't befriend everybody. But this is a show called Friendship is Magic. There's a very good chance that wouldn't fly. Pun intended. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to have the return of Gilda, I'm not as excited as others. I wasn't as quick to forgive as I think a lot of other folks were. You can blame my anime uh, <laughs> history for that. Uh, I'll more on that later. But it did paint Gilda in a more likable light. It gave her a renewed purpose. It expanded on the idea of Griffins immensely. However, in light of even more recent episodes and comics... There's a question that that is burning within me that I'll never that I uh, I guess it will be a tirade for later on in this review, but it's a question I very much want to ask. So we won't get into it in case right now because people might uh, might uh, not have seen this episode yet. But it is fun. It has truly adorable moments. It has a nice reconciliation, and you know, as re character redemptions go, Gilda's might actually be one of the most believable in this whole series. So, all in all enjoyable, but, oh, and there's also an observation about the crystal, the Tree of Harmony, that I just want to uh, bring up. But again, spoiler territory. We will uh, discuss right. when we get to the spoiler territory. So what about you, Norm? Oh, go ahead. 
I just want to apologize. I'm talking a lot about this episode without actually getting to say anything. That takes a lot of years to master, and sometimes that not that doesn't even work. <laughs> That's fine though. Uh, keep it for the spoiler. Keep it for the spoilers. So, what about you, Norman? Uh, for me, this one, I I was excited for this one because Gilda is one of those characters that. She didn't have much in season one going for her. So the hype for me was all done by fan fictions. So I read up on fan fiction stuff, including Gilda and whatnot. And yeah, I mean, how do I put this? The fan fiction personality of Gilda is not going to be the same that I know. But I was excited for what the showrunners are going to do with Gilda and what are they going to well, accomplish with her. And this call this episode did not disappoint it hit on all the points that I wanted to see the Griffin Empire the Griffin how Griffin economy works how well technically how Griffin lived and it did break some hit cannons in my mind but the explanation for what really happened was not bad it was pretty awesome and like Silver said there were some cute scenes here and there and I find it fun I, I enjoyed it this is one of those episodes where I'm like I cannot believe that I really enjoy this but I do uh, because the way that they have always introduced new locations in this show um, populated with anything that but bad ponies has always turned out a bit angry. I mean, Dragon Quest comes to mind when I'm talking about that kind of stuff uh Perhaps making the Griffons so greedy and all that comes with the territory. I mean, after the, the after all, the, the the way that they the place that they live in is uh, is in tatters. But I I was impressed that I am looking at this episode and I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's it's 22 minutes long. They managed to cram enough story to feel a Christopher Nolan movie in 22 minutes. How did they do that? I was impressed. Like as I was watching this. Uh, with all the different flashbacks told in all the different, uh, all those styles and all that, I was like, you guys are giving so much information. How is this going to affect the character development? And I'm like, it doesn't, it doesn't affect it at all. I mean, at no point I felt that Gilda was getting shoved to the side if, in favor of the story or vice versa. I think this is one of the best balance episodes in the entire series. Not just this season. It's not without its flaws, obviously, but we're going to get to that when we get to that. I think this episode was really fun. And it was really good. And it was it was really, really important to have an episode like this. Because it closed an open wound that this show has been carrying since season one. That is, uh, the character of Gilda was nothing but a literary tool uh to to move the the story forward into the inevitable conclusion like she was just serving a purpose in grief on the brush off she was just serving a purpose to to deliver the moral she never felt like a character in this episode she does feel like a character but let's talk about it and from now on we're going to get hit deep into spoilers so we should start discussing it i'm game let's do this so now let's go hit deep into spoilers so we start with, let's start, we start with Pinkie Pie baking in Sugar Cube Corner of all places. And, uh, am I the only one who had a small flashback to Generation 3.5? I, no, just you. You, Silver? No? Uh, I was too busy finding this so freaking adorable and Pinkie so, uh, funny in her conversations with Gummy. <laughs> My brain was kind of on a sugar overload itself. Uh, oh, <laughs> uh, now I'm thinking what Gummy's seriously thinking. Like, knowing what we know, like, I want to know what he's thinking. <laughs> Woe to thee, my beloved. Our time together has been exhausted. <laughs> Off you go, leave, leaving me to dwell in my loneliness. Consider wondering what is life while he has the egg bait on his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> What is life but a little crocodile, but a little alligator holding an egg bait on his mouth? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, the reason why I bring up the G, the G3.5, uh, comment is because there is one short, one animated short of, um, uh, Generation 3.5 in which Pinkie Pie is baking a cake 
going about her bakery and all that. And it looks very much like this scene right here. And I think if, if they are making a direct reference, that's perfectly fine. I mean, they make enough references to many other things and G and G one. Why not make in reference to the the, one, the generation that came before it? So, it, like seriously, it is almost shot for shot very similar to the uh, to that scene in in Generation Three Point Five. Really? No. Yeah, it's not a criticism. I actually like the fact that they bring up something and they show that they show it like, hey, you see, this is the way that it's supposed to be, and it's funny and it's it's silly and it's super cute. All right. Besides, it's something that we rarely see. When was the last time that you saw Pinkie Pie baking? Season one. It's been a while. It has been a while. So it is a joy to see Pinkie Pie in her environment. Though I wonder how sanitary that is. <laughs> I mean, come on. She's stuffing her hoof full of vanilla and just licking it off. I wouldn't want to eat one of her cakes. Not that you know of. <laughs> Actually, this also says something about Pinkie's care. No. Uh... I, I've described her as uh, extroversion incarnate, <laughs> uh, but that that was not correct. Pinky right now is by herself, aside from Gummy, but she hasn't lost any energy. She's doing this probably in anticipation of sharing this cake with her friends, so she's still got a lot of energy. Rainbow, by contrast, when she doesn't have someone watching her, her general fallback is to nap on a cloud. So I'd actually argue that that Rainbow Dash is more of an extrovert than Pinkie Pie. Take people, ponies, away, and she just loses all drive and energy. Just an interesting observation. But when she kisses Gummy goodbye, it's just like, okay, that's it. I I have diabetes. Uh, you mean diabetes. <laughs> tomato, tomato more. <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato. There is no other way to put it. Uh, oh gosh! But as Pinkie Pie is baking, she realizes that that her um her beeper <laughs> is beeping. I mean, no, her cutie mark is beeping, calling her or oh, uh, calling her. So it's the map of harmony that is summoning her to to its call. Uh, Zordon? Uh no. <laughs> Sordon is too good for this show. Anyway, <laughs> you don't mess with my childhood. <laughs> too much pink energy. It's not good. <laughs> too much. Leaving leaving Gummy in charge of the baking, and boy, is he going to do a cracking job at those treats. But yeah, apparently the the map has summoned both Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash to the city of Griffonstone. And even though Pinkie Pie is really excited about it, Rainbow Dash is not excited at mm. all. Because, oh, one Griffon was a jerk with me. That means all Griffons are jerks. <laughs> hey. That's profiling. No. <laughs> but Twilight actually reinforces this as she talks about their history. <laughs> not helping, that they were, <laughs> But they were naturally greedy, fought over every bauble. So is it kind of funny that the griffin with the most serious bling became their ruler? Mm, it does say something about their hierarchy. Apparently, he who has the most bling. Wow, they're all rappers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, all that gold sure will get you all them. That's not a word. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, that's not a word. <laughs> but then this brings up an uncomfortable uh, topic. Jeremy uh, Wheatley, uh, the writer for Friends Forever number 14. He took extreme issue with uh, Dragon Quest because mm. it basically said, in his interpretation, it said that your race determines your personality. Mm. You know, all dragons are jerks. And Spike would rather reject his race uh, rather than trying to be different. And as the father of a, of a daughter who is uh, part white, part black, he, took, he found that uh, message very caustic. Mm-hmm. So here's uh, another case where an entire race is described as being greedy, selfish, and unpleasant. Well, and and I also find this interesting because now I have a totally legit excuse for how my character behaves. <laughs> uh, I'm acting like a jerk. Oh, part Griffin. Oh, I'm abduct- <laughs> I'm abducting another princess. Part Griffin. Oh, you. Uh, no, but honestly speaking, yes. Uh, Jeremy Whitley does the does have the right to say, or does have the right to his opinion in 
um, what was what, what's the episode called again? Spike. Uh, oh, the Spike and Luna friends forever. No, Here's the one. Oh, what drag, dragon, dragon quest. quest. Yeah, dragon I mean, quest. he does have uh, his opinion, his own opinion for that episode because yes, uh, with that, with that, it's okay. All dragons are jerk. They're greedy and they grow big, but I don't agree with that because of the recent comic that came out with the Spike Luna friends forever. So that changed the perception a little bit. So that's good. That's what he wrote. Mm, that, then again, good. when you have a when you have a bad bad experience with uh, with someone, you tend to base that frame of reference for anything that lo- anyone that looks like them. Mm. But for this one here with the Griffin Empire or Griffin Stone itself, it's a totally unknown race, and this is done from scratch, like. We are given little info. Oh, it's of not totally an unknown, an unknown rage, race. We have seen Griffons in the past before, True, besides Gilda. There was Gustav Legrand and the Griffons from the, the Equestria games. Yeah, but we got no idea how their personality is because in those episodes, we know Gustav is a proud Griffon who thinks highly of himself with his cooking and we know we know nothing of the Griffon history, is what you're yeah. trying to say. Yeah, that's the thing. And with the sport Griffons, we got no idea how they act. Probably well, they in act that like case, jerks from Cool Running, but hey, that's just a personality this is, trait. Well, this is something that the episode is fighting against, and you have to take this into consideration, mm, is that true. there is no other episode that has uh, bothered mm. no, that, that bother to talk about the Griffon history before this one. So what Amy Keaton Rogers and Amy Larson before her, because if you didn't know, Amy Larson was the one who started writing this episode before giving it to Amy so he could go work on episode 100, uh, was that they are fighting against a 22 minute, a 22 minute time, uh, time limit, mm-hmm. uh, that they have to cope with in order to tell the story of the kingdom, uh, talk about where it came from, what the what? Why is the reason the reason for their personality? Why are they built like that? Mm-hmm. So there is a lot of hindrance in there. Like I don't think it really flows all that well. Now that you guys are mentioning it, mm-hmm. but it could have been an awful lot worse. That doesn't excuse the mistake, though. The mistake, though. But take what you what you get. Mm. The other point is with this episode, it's. A uh, retcon of the whole characteristic near the end. But well, with... hang on a minute. What do you mean retcon? Because okay, at the beginning we have the Griffins. They're greedy and they are very selfish. Near the end, because of one Griffin, things oh, will be uh, changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you, you're jumping ahead of yourself. No, yeah, no, but we still... didn't even leave the castle at this point. Hey, I'm interested in Griffins. Yeah, but are we going to follow the the order of the episode, or are we going to talk I'm about? I'm sorry, the I'm sorry. Anyway, oh, order, oh, order. structure. Oh, <laughs> well, I I personally feel kind of bad for Twilight, who, <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, she is so Excited. frustrated that she doesn't get to go. <laughs> that the ma- the map has said, oh, we don't. This is the first message mission outside of the premiere. And the princess of friendship, the one who was supposed to receive all this stuff and fulfill her grand destiny, ain't invited. <laughs> Slap to the face. Honestly <laughs> speaking, right? Honestly speaking, if uh, writers and whatnot are not involved, like if they're just characters, like real life characters, would you, did, would you mind if Twilight just joined them? Well, I'm of two minds on that. Yes, she should have the autonomy to say, I'd still like to go. I won't get in the way. Mm-hmm. But she is also a very by-the-books character. If she is not included in it, then by her belief that the Tree of Harmony has some grand purpose, she'll hold back. And as she says, do important princess stuff, which, good Lord, the last couple episodes have really made me uncomfortable with that topic. Uh, let's just wait and see then. What good are princesses anymore? <laughs> I don't know. Even the princess of friendship. Yeah! Anyway, uh, so I I wish Twilight could go just for the knowledge, but at the, as Pinky will later note, yes, I'm jumping ahead as well, uh, it's probably better that she didn't, uh, else she'd become princess of genocide. <laughs> 
Besides, she's there in hairstyle, thanks to Rainbow Dash. Yes, yes. Uh, this, this, I geeked out at this moment. This moment was very fun. <laughs> well, it's something that you barely, that you have never seen. Actually, I have never seen something like this happen in the show. Where one of them will impersonate the other and they will acquire their hairstyle. That was fun. Yeah. That was just for, for laughs. Like, this is done for us. No, that's a that's a typical joke that flows well and it ends with a very neat punchline. <laughs> uh, but well, just to be, just to give my two cents on the whole uh, Twilight theme, I think that's more like the 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 map is speaking the the writers are speaking through the map hmm. because as the episode goes forward, you realize that Twilight would have done nothing in that scenario. Because the, the 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 whole conflict, the whole reason for them to go there, I don't think would be to recover the the artifact, mm. the, the 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 goblet or whatever it is, the the trophy mm-hmm. that the Griffons had at one point in their history, but so much as to mend fen- mend fences with uh, with Gilda and the two characters that had the closest connection to Gilda were Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash. This, this is the, at this point we are recording this on the twenty eighth of June. We haven't seen the episode Mending Fences, Ooh, wow. but that episode two is about uh, fixing a relationship that was broken around season one, and that one is going to have Twilight Sparkle as the focus. No, no spoilers. No spoilers. Mm, there's going to be, no, and no spoilers. But it feels like this this season, the theme is going to be uh, fixing relationships mm. and rebuilding bridges that were uh, destroyed or burned in the past. Mm, I, I can see so, that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a very good feeling about this season mm. so far. But this episode, this episode, yeah. we're on the train now. Well, one more thing before we move on to the train. The, oh. the other aspect that just came into mind is, is when Twi- if Twilight were to join them, it would be a royal visit from a princess. And I don't think Griffin Stone would want Twilight to be there to witness what's happened to them. Mm. Or or they wouldn't give two figs. Ah, yeah, that's also true. But to the train! So, yeah, in the train we see that Pinkie Pie has no concern about spending. Or at least she, she expends her... no sense. She uh, at least keeps her energy up. That sugar rush should sustain a, a preschool. Do you really want to have Pinkie Pie with Sugar Rush? Hey, they sell so fruits and fruits. Fruits have sugar. Yeah. Fruits have sugar. Yeah. Apples, I mean, grapes, yeah. I'm I'm just going to say, I don't think we've ever seen Pinkie without a Sugar Rush. I'm pretty sure if she didn't have sugar for a day, she'd just dissolve. Oh, yeah, that, that's also <laughs> true. But then they, and they both look good in hats. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah Mongolian hats, by uh-huh. the way. All the time while Twilight narrates the, the whole thing and uh, explains uh, what are they going to find and the places that sh- they should go and where they should take pictures <laughs> and not forget, don't forget to try the scones. <laughs> uh, Just throwing that out there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's not going to be relevant to the episode or anything. Or anything. Oh, yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. And after such build up, after t- being told that, oh, it's, it's the most magnificent kingdom in all of Equestria, they arrive and they find the Griffon version of Detroit. <laughs> uh, like, almost, almost quite literally. The only thing missing is a Robo Griffon. <laughs> Silent scum! Ah, team song playing in my head right now. Oh god, that would be so awesome. But yeah, they do find out that the, the Griffonstone is not as magnificent and as amazing as it's believed to be anymore. That the place is pretty much in, in ruins because they did lose their one and only, and only most prized possession. That it doesn't, it, it's not there anymore. It's, lo- it was lost. Um, and who else is there but none other than Best cat bird in the planet. Hello, Gilda. <laughs> Dash. Dash. Pinky. Do- Donkey. <laughs> and Stephen. <laughs> Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, Newman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been building that one up, ain't we? <laughs> yeah, we have. But no, and... Oh gosh! Well, they 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 meet up with Gilda, and the the reunion couldn't be more 
uh, bumpy. It is obvious that these three still have some issues to work with each other. And even with that, they end up finding uh, finding the information that they need from Grandpa Graf. <laughs> Who is, I don't know, am I the only one looking at this guy and thinking, oh, look, it's a Griffon version of Grunkle Stan from Gravity Falls. Oh, if he does... All the way down to the grid. Well, he does look similar to um, the Smurfless villain. Who was it again? Oh, Gargamel? Yeah. Really? I've not seen it. The blind eye. He's just a fun... Design. So many of the Griffins in this have different bird uh, characteristics. We've got oh, yeah. two that are yeah. that are dicing. We enter a, an owl-looking fellow, mm-hmm. uh, Gilda, and then consider this against the the recolors from Equestria Games. Oh. I mean, it's night and day. Oh, true that. True that. And by the way, the way that they have uh, they and uh, they are animating Gilda in this one. It does show the contrast between season one and season five. It's so more apparent because we did We have never seen. We this is the first time that we see G ever since the the, the first season. How this is the first time we see her in five years, literally five years. Oh yes, that's so true. You can totally see. You can totally see this, the 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 leap forward in quality when it comes mm. to the animation. So, you guys, and I know who you are, who say. Uh, Season seasons four and five are so horrible because the animation has become so unnatural. You can shut the hell up. Uh, you are absolutely wrong. Yeah, I think they know this by now. Oh well, but they 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 are told even more story because this is they do get some insight uh, straight from the from the Griffons themselves of what happened with the what happened with that statue, what happened with the trophy. That it got stolen by this one-eyed monster whose name I can never, it doesn't stick with me. I can Ari never. Arimaspi. Say what again? The Arimaspi. Guess you hide. <laughs> but. <laughs> Actually, this, this is kind of fascinating. There is an actual myth about the Arimaspi, but it is not a giant cyclopean anthro goat. Oh. Across that list of things I never thought I'd say. Uh, <laughs> co- according to Wikipedia, so it must be true, the Aramaspi <laughs> were a legendary people of northern Scythia who lived in the foothills of the Riffian Mountains, variously identified with the Uriel Mountains and the Carpathians. All tales of their struggles with the gold-guarding griffins in Hyperborean lands near the Cave of Boreas, the northern wind, had their origin in the lost work by... Uh, Aristius reported in Herodotus. So a lot of Greek mythology, I believe. They were always fighting with the Griffins over gold. And lo and behold, here's this creature who covets gold just as much as the Griffins. You say this is Greek mythology. Yes, look at the way this flashback is constructed. The way that it's drawn. This is this is my favorite part of the entire episode. The way the flashbacks and the, the, the history lessons are presented. They are so unique and they are so striking. This could be, this could very well be like the, the trailers, the, the, the after the credits, uh, title, t- credit title sequence on the movie 300. It has the same feel to it. Like this is, okay, it's still PG, it's still family friendly and all that, but you're seeing Griffons being thrown left and right, getting the crap beat out of them. This is very, uh, violent for what this TV show is has us used to. And it's awesome. Like seeing this bit of history and how they expand on the mythology of a town that we didn't even know existed before uh, was great. And how they managed to cram all of that in like a barely one minute long flashback sequence. It is really good. I, I in my humble opinion, it is really good. That's one way to tell a lore. Hmm. Yeah. And so we come to the split in tactics. Ah, yes. This this is a miscommunication on what really should have been done. Dash said that, hey, we just need to use... No, we just need to get back the idol and everything will be peachy. While Pinky sees something different. But Pinky follows what, what uh, Twilight told her to do. Twilight told her to go to the library first. 
get the books, study the, the lore, see how you can figure out a, a way out of the situation. Let's see if you can find the idol that way. Dash is more like idol. Which way? There? Okay. Robe. Helmet. Let's go. You know what? Forget the helmet. Let's go get it. They already know where, well, generally know where it is because they know that the Aramiti, what was it? Aramiti. Yeah. Ar- Aramaspi. Aramaspi took Aramaspi. it and he went through the gorge or something like that. So they generally know where it is. Now they just need to hunt it down. And Pinky's looking for it from another angle, probably from what James said. Like, go to the library and try to do some research on it. But Rainbow Dash does things her way, while Pinky does things her way. Very. Though, it, though it is, it, it, it's funny how the the random, quote-unquote, psychotic one has the most sensible idea, which is just to, st- to study the situation before go- rushing in into it. Rainbow Dash has always been a character of... Uh, where do I hit it and how hard do I hit it? Well, Pinky has always been the one for planning because of her party planning. And making out with the statue. Oh, yeah. Making oh, out yeah. with the statue. Oh, gosh. Oh, yeah. I guess. But then it's actually Pinky and Gilda for a good chunk of this while Rainbow gets another griffin who's never named, but <laughs> is awful. Oh. She's I just mean, a she's... business pony. She's just a business griffin. It's all business. You Come on. If we could leave someone to die, you've crossed the line. Hey, come on. It's all business. Come on. If you don't give me my cash, I am I am forced to break your kneecap. Thanks, Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> I you know what? You know what, Silver? I don't know, but that kind of uh, that kind of situation could very well happen in the real world. <laughs> like not everybody not everybody is good for others. Like, okay, you're in a tight situation. What is this? What does this uh, get me? Like, what am I getting out of all this? What am I getting from helping you? Uh, the fact that you are helping me, that's not enough. I'm sorry, but it's not worth my time. Bye. You're a terrible person! I think I will be able to live with that. <laughs> well, so here's, the, that but can... here's the thing. The, the, they're saying this is all griffins. All griffins are like this. Well, understanding how they live, yeah. That's the norm. It, it is it is clear that they have gotten to the point that they are uh, hell you are talking about Greek Greek mythology and all that Greece is in a similar situation as we are talking right now uh, not even joking and to be honest Spain was heading the same way before uh, before the government changed and, and and everything and decided to put a bit more um, a bit more econo- better economical measures that managed to get the seat, the, the country out of the out of the recession. So yeah, you know what I was joking about Detroit being uh, uh, Detroit being an analogy for um, for Griffinstone. I think Madrid would have been a much better analogy <laughs> for for Griffinstone than than Detroit because holy uh, cow! Hey, come on, but come on, think about it. Like you're in a slump. Your dream, your goal in life is to get out of there, and the only way to do that is to earn a lot of bits and stay yeah. in. Or have a comfy life in Manhattan or kind of lot. Yeah, or no, even doesn't doesn't that deal. put the ep- doesn't that put the episode of Griff on the brush of in such a terrible perspective, where you suddenly realize that Gilda was saving up money to go visit her friend Dash, only to be brushed off as a bully. That's 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 not that's not a fact too. Yeah, that, that's just sad. Yeah. Well, actually, actually, that that ties into my earlier comment about uh, my anime upbringing. <laughs> You know how many times I've they've they played the card of yes I've killed millions and nearly brought the world to its knees but I had a bad childhood <laughs> feel bad for me. No. Well, Gilda Moon. didn't ki- Gilda didn't kill anybody. Sa- uh, Sailor Moon was was notorious for this. Oh, I had such a bad life. Okay, we're, I'm instantly forgiven. Baloney. Oh wow. Uh, <laughs> well, well, hey, hey, hey. Just give it a moment because Gilda in the Griff on the Brush of episode couldn't be considered a character. Like I said at the beginning, she was a tool to move the lesson forward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In this episode, she feels more like a character. And one of the most interesting, one of the most, I was about to say interesting, is not interesting, uh, generic, uh, uh, character development plots that they will follow is to make the character have a very bad childhood or have a very difficult childhood, like, you know, the socially inept, uh, socially, socially inept kid that doesn't have any friends 
until they meet the one. <laughs> and then they have a fallout between each other and then they come back and reunite. Yeah. That is that is as classic as you can imagine. It doesn't bother me, but I can see how it could bother other people. Yeah. I don't know. To me, the character Gilda here, I find her development or the writer's the way that the writer developed her was pretty awesome because we didn't get much out of Griffin the Brush Off because that one was, well, basically, Gilda's visiting Ponyville to meet her best friend that she haven't met in a long time. And Pinkie Pie doesn't get the message that I want to hang out with Dash, so give us space, yo. And, well, sometimes with her characteristic and knowing how Griffins are now is understandable. But, we get more lure for Gilda here. Who knew she was a baker? Well, at least trying to be one. Apparently she never heard of baking soda before today. <laughs> oh, I just love that line. I just love that line. Let me guess. Friendship. No, uh, no baking, baking powder. powder. Luckily for yeah. you, I never live I never live home without it. Now just pop those things in the oven. Oh god. Ah oh, wow. How many times have you watched this episode, Norman? It shows that you watched it actually several times. I love this episode. You know what? I do, I do lament that I will never be able to have one of those corns, uh, scones, I mean. But not, not because they are animated and cartoonish, but I'm allergic to acorns. <laughs> don't, don't have acorns then. Ay, ay, ay. I can put, I can, I, I cannot put any type of nut and something tells me that they are important to the recipe. So, yeah. Um, okay, now, you, you know what, you guys were talking about Gilda and why people like Gilda so much. They, p- people like this character enough that even with just one appearance, they they dedicated her not just one of the blind bags, but also one of the Funko vinyls. Wasn't there a Funko vinyl of Gilda? No, there hasn't. No? It's only oh, the it was, blind bags. I was not mistaken yet. then. Yet. I was mistaken. But hopefully they will one day. Truthfully, I think Gilda got the same attention as Trixie for a similar reason. Hmm. She left in a huff. There was potential for redemption and people wanting, I think, to see redemption stories done well, just wanted to create these epically terrible up backstories for her. Why is she so mean? And well, this, I think this uh, episode does validate her in many ways, saying you that know- she kind of She came from a bad environment. It's just, I'm no longer a person who just gives a free pass because you had a bad upbringing. I'm a very big believer in, at some point in your life, you choose how you behave. And Gilda chose poorly. Yeah, and looking at how, looking at the options she was given, I think she may have chosen the right decision at the time. But in the long run, it was the wrong one. I think that the way they redeem this character was better than the way that they redeemed Trixie. Mm, totally agree on that. There are ways of doing it. Trixie was always the pathetic villain. She was the the the, the, the jokey villain until she became uh, drunk with power during the show shortened season three. And because they were under the time constraint, they didn't, they, they, they were unable to give her a proper send off. Uh, they did manage to recover Trixie in the comic books. That's good. Mm. I am wondering if they will ever bring her back in the TV show. After developing her so much in the comics, I doubt they will bring her back in yeah, the show. But they, 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 it, it doesn't it doesn't really matter anyway because she's redeemed out the door. There you go. Let's mm. move on to the next plot. True. This episode has better redeem better redeeming qualities for Gilda anyway. Mm-hmm. Because even after they show her that she was, you know, well, I don't see her being. All that bullied, they just call her a few names and then Rainbow Dash comes into the rescue to befriend her. They do make her a much more likable character while still keeping the brassness, na- the brassness of her nature. Like, Hannah and Lucer, I'm coming! <laughs> what took you so long, doofus? So, yeah. the, the, no, the way that they talk to each other, they talk to each other more like, uh, long friends that haven't, that, uh, that, that have been, that have known each other for a while. True that, true that. I mean, we're skipping yeah. a lot here. We're skipping a lot here. Uh, we, we, we're skipping an awful lot. We are, yeah. but... I'll just summarize it up. Like, uh, Pinkie Pie wants to help Gilda with picking. Rainbow Dash and Griffin character goes to the gorge. And... Yeah, Rainbow Dash is trying to recover the artifact yeah. while she gets trapped under there. Because the wind currents are so yeah. bad, she runs the risk of getting smashed against the wall. Mm-hmm. Asking for her for help solves nothing because the Griffon demands beats and she doesn't have any. 
And then Pinkie Pie finds Rainbow Dash at the bottom of the gorge. Yeah, and well, she's before, unable to bring her back. Yeah, before that, she... yeah, before that, with uh, subliminal advertising and Pinkie Pie getting a realization of what they really need to do. Yeah, and that's when we are told Gilda's backstory. Yeah, and okay, that. no, no, before that, what? Yeah, be- before the Gilda backstory, we see that Rainbow Dash falls, hurt her legs, don't have any bits, and other Griffin says bye bye. I said that already. <laughs> I know. I'm just, I'm just need to, I, I just need to uh, buy the books, man. Buy the books. Buy the uh, books. This review is a bit all over the place, not right I now. Know. and I don't know if it's because of the episode, because the episode actually feels very focused. Oh yeah, the episode's focused. We're not. <laughs> no, we're not. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, now uh, let's get it back on track to Gilda's backstory. Yay. Well, I, th- I think um, we already covered her backstory. She's was perfect. Yeah, we... This speaks really well of Rainbow Dash, who now between Gilda and Fluttershy seems to stick up for those who aren't uh, able to stick up for themselves or mm. are in a moment of vulnerability. Mm. Which shows, for all of Dash's ego problems, she always does stick up for the underdogs. Hero complex, maybe? It doesn't have to be a negative. Mm. Co- complex implies negativity, a certain sense of honor. Uh. It is possible that she acts like that because she also does get, you know, she gets called names and the bullies do mess with her. But yeah. while others don't have her confidence... <laughs> uh, they don't trust. They don't. They don't trust themselves as much as she trusts herself. Yeah. She makes a point to actually defend the others because they cannot. <laughs> so yeah, you know what? That is actually a very interesting part of her personality. Mm, that's cool. That she does stick up for those who cannot stick up for themselves. That, that's awesome. And I've seen a comic where it tells the story. What if Fluttershy was the one to greet Gilda first? <laughs> oh, that was so interesting. She is so cute. I know. I'm sorry. I just can I cannot stop looking at how adorable her design is. I know. And I mean, we have seen Philly ponies in the past, but we have never seen a uh, uh, John Griffin in the past. Uh, now this yes. is this is a really cool, and we see the origin of the Junior Spitz, uh, Junior Spitz, uh, Spitzers chant. Yes, yes, which I is uh, great. It's a good way to tie that with the previous episode, mm-hmm. builds up from that, and it gives Gilda a reason to actually do something good for once, even though it kills her. I mean, I look at know. that face. She's so angry that she has to be nice for once. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I need my insulin. That, that, that was make so me cute. Friend. <laughs> really not dead, except it does. <laughs> While looking at the camera. Uh... <laughs> and so, uh, both Gilda and Pinkie Pie go to rescue Rainbow Dash. And it takes both their efforts to uh, uh, get her back, uh, back on top of the cliff. On a actually a very intense, very well done and very well choreographed action scene, mm-hmm. where it's a first Gilda goes and try, tries to get to Dash, but the wind is too powerful; she cannot get to it, and Dash starts falling. Pinkie Pie ties the rope that she that Gilda is tied to, and throws herself <laughs> to try and catch Rainbow Dash, <laughs> hoping somehow that Gilda will be able to grab onto something to stop their fall. Thankfully, that is exactly what happens. Uh, well, then again, I guess uh. Pinkie Pie was trusting Gilda with her both her talons and the claws on her paws, which we have never seen until now, by the way. Well, uh, this is... The, okay, when I first saw this scene where Pinkie Pie is like tying, this, tying a rope to herself and jumping off the cliff, logic dictates that, oh, Pinkie Pie, you should tie that rope to the wall, sorry, to the rock beside there. It's the most logical thing. Do it. Nope. You know, I'm not an alpinist. I am not. Uh, I am. I have never climbed in my life. But this is kind of like a classic scenario. It's a bit forced, I have to admit. But it's this classic scenario where you have someone falling, and then uh, that someone else being used as an anchor uh, <laughs> for for the third guy to try and go save the first guy that just fell, <laughs> fell through, uh, fell down the cliff. And having the, 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 having the guy serving as an anchor trying to hold the, the weight of the bo- both of the guys. Oh wow. But lo and behold, of coincidence of all coincidences, they fall and they crash right, and Gildy is able to grab onto the ledge where 
the remains of that one-eyed monster are, and on the other side of the cliff is the idol. Mm. So uh, then Gilda has to choose. Does she save the idol or does she save uh, uh, her friend? It's important to note that Indiana Gilda, <laughs> uh, ultimately yes. she does make the right decision to... Hey there, listeners. Just want to let you know that Silver... Pull a funny joke on us. Yes. Can't play it here. So you are hearing my voice over this hilarious prank by Silver. Uh, he got us good. Anyway, back to the episode. Uh, you two copyrights gonna have fun. My day is complete. Uh, you know YouTube what? I'm not gonna have fun on that. I. I Journey I'm not age. even mad. I'm not even mad. I would be mad in the past, but you know what? I have finally learned to also let it go. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, wow! It's, no, it it is it is a good classic moment, and I'm I, I'm pretty sure a direct callback to uh, to Indiana Jones. True, but I don't know. I mean, I have an issue with this, like uh, making Gilda choose the idol or her friends. Like, if she just waited and pulled the ponies up. She would have got both. Well, we you never know. A strong wind could come and take it away. Yeah, but I don't know. It's been there for and, years. And, so. and this and this is again Griffin greed. Yeah, she's had, really, really. It's not as much choosing between the idol and herself and her friends as it is choosing behind her the instinct she's been raised to value mm. versus what she wants. Well, no, when you put it that way, it makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, so I, I, I don't see a, a complex there. Yeah, but I don't know. I mean, this, in, in my logic, I think that the most um, logical course of action is just to wait and uh, after everybody's safe, go get it. Usually, every uh, people can make the wrong decisions under pressure. You mm. can... You may try to get the idol because you think you have uh, a strong enough footing that you can actually allow uh, your friends to hang out for a couple more minutes before they fall over and they die. Um, and then it's it's like no, you have. Then it comes to the moment where you have to make the choice: either you get the idol or you get your friends. And thankfully, Gilda decides to take uh, to to get her friends back. Well, her friend back. I don't think that even after this episode, she considers Pinkie Pie to be one of her friends. Hey, um, she she's a lot, she's a lot tougher than that anyway. But it is, it is, I, I, it, it makes me happy that she makes the right choice. Though it does, it, it doesn't come as a surprise, you know? Because I mean, come on, the episode is telegraphed that way. It's meant to end that way. It's mm. meant to have that lesson. You know, that is how it's going to happen. But mm -hmm. after seeing Gilda the way she is and the way she behaves and seeing all those Griffons being the way they are, there was still a hint of a doubt that maybe she's going to finally give in to her instincts and she's going to do something else. But no, she decides to play, they play the straight and I am happy that they did play the straight. They go with the redeeming character. She has, she has a reason to be, there is a reason to love her. Aside from, you know, having an interest in design and being radical. Is that, the, you no, know, really, like, when you think about that, after watching this episode, I did, uh, I did take a couple of days to, th to, to think, okay, why did I like this character to begin with? And I couldn't think of any reason that was like, oh, I like it because it has good character, or I like it because it's likable or anything. No. None. I had no reason to like this character, other than the way it looks. What more can we say? I mean, Gilda is an interesting character, and I think this pivotal moment here proves to us that she's an awesome character. And she'll be the one to start spreading friendship around uh, the other Griffins. Oh, yeah. But now this brings up the question of who will become the new leader for Griffinstone? Hmm. Like, Maybe they should have an Iron Chef competition or he, something. I don't know. And Gilda will win. <laughs> if, if it was Gilda, oh, my God, that was a huge leap. Actually, I'm kind of expecting a Griffin Council at this point. Oh, yeah. I mean, but still, if she was the one to hit it off, like a prime, that would have... Whew. A Griffin Senate. Yeah. But no, no. We, we're jumping all over the place right now. Let's let's try and end this properly. Well, actually, there's two things that we haven't gotten to talk about. Uh -huh. that 
I, I want to discuss. Yes, please. Because this is out beyond the scope of the episode, which I fully expected to end with seeing uh, Sugar Cube Corner on fire. <laughs> because uh... Pink, Pinky left the oven going. And good Lord, how long? Travel in Equestria is so elastic. Mm, true that. I was they expecting make it look like They make it look like it's going to take, it takes a while uh, for them to get to Griffonstone, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They do, but then, but then in more recent episodes, you can get there in less than an afternoon. In an hour. But two things. One, the tree uh, through the map sent Pinky and Dash. Now, this brings up the whole destiny versus free will question because there's an argument to be made, I think, that the tree knew Rainbow would go for the idol and put her life at risk versus Rainbow just did, made a bad call. So, if it's the former, the tree of harmony is a... That's not a word! <laughs> I, I don't see it that way, man. Like, I don't see it that way. The tree of harmony knows, or yeah, the tree of harmony sends what needs uh, what needs to be done or who which pony needs to go there to solve the problem rainbow dash saw it her way to solve the problem yet pinky saw it another way to solve the problem i, I don't think that it knows everything no i think the tree of harmony and the map in particular they are both controlled by the by uh, the mystical magician uh, Mitch A. Larson, uh, uh, because it is clear that the Tree of Harmony knows, hey, there is a season one character here that has to be recovered, and we need to redeem it. Quick, send the two characters that had the closest connection to it. Who were they? Uh, let's go back to the previous episode. Oh, yeah, Pinky and Dash. They are the ones that know how to deal with this conflict. Let's do this. Uh, oh, yes. but, if, but if we go with that answer, then you've broken the immersion. So when you do that, though, the, sto the show itself starts to suffer because now you're saying, okay, this is just because the writer said so. Uh, then suddenly I'm not watching A Tale of the Ponies. I'm watching script writers try to throw stuff at the wall. <laughs> There's a very yeah. unhappy difference between them. No, I'm not. I'm not saying this is a good way to put it. By the way, <laughs> this is this is probably the biggest criticism that I have for the for the episode because the story is absolutely fantastic. And I will just say right away, I absolutely adore when a TV show, a movie, or whatever gives you the lore. Like one of my favorite parts of Lord of the Rings is when they tell all of those epic battle stories where they say and then they fought at Helm's Deep or then at the, they fought at the at the uh, base of Mount, the Mount of Destiny and you see like the elves and the humans join together to fight all those evil orcs and that, that those are the coolest parts of those movies for me and this episode does that very much. The problem is the way that it's been done like why bring in Pinky and Dash to Griffonstone for no other reason than because they were the characters with the most screen time in Griffon the Brashov, and then they need to redeem the character of Gilda, who, by the way, I love to see come back, I love the way that they redeem her, I love the way that they brought her back and everything, but everything around it is so unnecessarily forced well, and I... so unnecessarily contrived. I don't... There was... There was no need to make the characters, to make the 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 the, the people the people of Griffonstone, Griffonstone the way that they made them, only for them to have one final moment where Gilda has to decide between her friends and and the idol. So, well, like, the, what's what's the reasoning behind that? Nothing. They were just throwing that out there. I don't know. I mean, if you're gonna go that route, I, I don't see it that way. To me, the tree itself is, well, technically it's a deus ex machina. It tells people what to do in hindsight, yes. But I, I believe that the tree has plans or the way that the tree works is it's based around finding friendship problem and solving it. And clearly that Griffinstone is in a spot where it needs to be fixed. Well, it's best to send Twilight. Twilight is not going to help the way that it needs to be helped. They send Pinkie Pie and Rainbow Dash here because Pinkie Pie doesn't hold a grudge. Rainbow Dash, on the other hand, does. And knowing how Rainbow Dash characteristic is very gun ho uh, doesn't think twice about solving a problem her way, which is getting the idol first, while Pinkie Pie 
looks and assess the whole situation and solves the problem in her way, which is making the griffins be nice to one another. Well, this is go- it's going to depend on how you interpret the tree, uh, the tree of harmony, and the map of harmony, and the all that good stuff. That that was one point that we wanted to bring up. What was the other? Well, to quote Gilda, "Ha ha, here we go, typical pony hero complex." <laughs> Let's let's look at all the lands we've seen, both in the comics and uh, the TV show. And yes, I'm going to jump ahead to episodes that have aired, but we haven't reviewed yet. Mm-hmm. We've got uh, Griffin Stone, which is in the dumps. Uh-huh. We've got Tyrix, uh origin land, mm-hmm. which didn't look all that appealing. It's mostly just barren rocks and skulls. We've got the Badlands, where the Changelings reside. We've got Yak Yakistan, which uh, is snow and un- and loud inhabitants, and one really cute one. What does the rest of the world have to offer ponies? It seems like Equestria is the only land of wealth, fertility, and peace. Everywhere else blows. Well, think about it this way, Silver. Like, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't, I can't believe I'm going to make this analogy, but. Equestria itself is like the United States. Everybody dreams to go there, live there, to make business with them, and to have a relationship with the states, <laughs> hoping to have <laughs> hoping to have great. You're saying this with a straight face. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's Norman, how I... Norman, 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 Nor- shut up. I'm hey. waiting for the punchline. Where <laughs> yeah, Norman, where are you going with this I other than with the joke? <laughs> no, I'm serious about this. Like, that's how I... Oh my... <laughs> that's the punchline right there. <laughs> that's how I look at it. I, the, the, that's how I... Imagine okay, okay, it. let Probably, me, let okay, me help you right the... there. Okay, drop the whole United States analogy. Yeah, okay. Equestria is the be is the 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 hub of haha. <laughs> it's the hub <laughs> of uh, commerce and society and all that. Like if if Equestria is that big, and in a couple of episodes we actually are told that Equestria it is indeed that big, then uh, what we what we know is. Is there are many races in there, but it most primordially are uh, ponies, and it could be like Pegasi, unicorn, crystal ponies, or earth ponies. Like zebras don't count, griffons don't count, dragons don't count, but they might add to like what perhaps a, if there is like seventy five percent ponies, that could be a five percent of each one of the other races. It's primordially ponies, so of course they will have the more development, the more expansion. But it is true that they do their best to become the, the, the equestrian police. That for them, they have to fix everything. Like what, what is the team formed by the elements of harmony? Six ponies. Which one is the one that gets, to, uh, uh, promoted into a princess? It's a pony princess. Uh, a unicorn pony princess that gets promoted to alicorn. The way that they, uh, that the rest of the equestria will see it is that there will be, pe- there will be, uh, there will be races that support the ponies. There will be races that will be against the ponies. You cannot make friends without making some enemies at the same time. Actually, I've, so far I've been seeing that ponies think they can make friends with everybody. Unless yeah. they're evil, like changelings. But my, my well, question is, I, Norman, to take the American analogy <laughs> just for a minute. Just a little bit. All right. Oh, God. <laughs> Despite the idea that everybody wants to be here, which I'm not really sure is true anymore... America still relies on other countries for importing, exporting, economic support, technical support. We are not an island nation. Equestria is. They don't need anything from anyone else. This is truly a fantasy land because Equestria lacks for nothing, and yet they're so benevolent that they want to reach out and spread their ideals to everyone else. I don't think they're... Um, going to spread their ideals. It's just making friends. But Pinky is saying, you need to spread friendship. That'll solve your problems. <laughs> well, you know what? Gilda, I'm going to walk out to her and say, Gilda, you need to lead a violent resolution, revolution and seize power and become a tyrannical despot. Just say. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I for know. once welcome our overlord Griffon guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. I, when I become I, the clown jester, I will do anything you want for you. you oh want my! To do no, 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 no! Shut up! Uh, 
All hail King Queen Cadbird. <laughs> uh, so, I don't know. Uh, and so I, I'm sorry if I sound like the pessimist in this, but you kind of step back and you realize, why haven't other nations tried to invade Equestria more often? They've got all the cool stuff. It's, I, you know what? I think it's because within the theme of this show, that doesn't work. Besides, it's something that many other shows are doing that already. I mean, you know, sometimes they bring up the, they bring up the, uh, usually people that, that frown upon anal- analysts and reviewers, they say, well, this is not Game of Thrones. What do you want? And I'm like, oh, shut up. <laughs> you can analyze anything. It's a way for people to enjoy what they like. Mm-hmm. They sit down and then they need pick and analyze whatever because they are enjoying it and they're having fun. But in this case, I will say, yeah, this show is not Game of Thrones. I don't oh. see... I don't see Rarity going to the Dragon Kingdom, becoming the the Khaleesi of the unicorns, and then taking over Canterlot. Although <laughs> oh, that I would be see. awesome. But... <laughs> but, but wouldn't it be great for Rarity to go to a foreign land in search of their rare and uh, expensive silk that she yeah. could bring back to Equestria? It's not that I want gross political intrigue or, uh, you know... Uh, backstabbing or even war though we almost had that in the last episode Mm -hmm. uh it's that right now it feels like the world is unbalanced friendships can often arise because someone has a strength that you lack to say that if you view a nation as an as an identity equestria is almost mary sewish perfection well not really because you you can see equestria as a utopia but it is not a utopia, because utopias don't have giant dragons that can burn you to ash with their breaths. They don't have manticores or cockatrices that can turn you into stone. They don't have evil tyrannical overlords that come back to reclaim what stairs that steal your magic and your identity. Lords of chaos, armies of changelings that can, cha- that can steal your identity and the identity of the one you love. And it's not... Uh, it's always in the brink of the of destruction because it's been attacked by many things. Mm-hmm. The only utopian characteristic of Equestria comes from its political side, where I think all the nations realize that, oh, guys, that's not a word. It's about to get. F- that's not a word. You can uh, censor that later, Norman, mm-hmm. if you want. But we better be ready to work together. So it's a good idea if we build friendships. I mean the. The, the the theme of this season so far has been you, you know what, what about mending bridges and building uh, friendships among mm. uh, among different races. If this doesn't add up to a kick-ass finale where you have uh, all these other nations coming together to fight an evil guy or an evil whatever, it's going to be very disappointing. Like this whole this whole work for something is going to be uh, worth nothing. Yeah, I do have to point out that this is just the second time the map has been uh, used to highlight a particular issue. So we'll just have to wait and see how it goes on after that. But I, I also want to point out that we, we invoke the name Utopia, but we've also distorted uh, the meaning of that word. The original Utopia was a city-state that exists in great prosperity because the citizenry was very active in... Uh, polit- politics and in education. Let's be honest, the, the citizens of Equestria are not all that involved outside of episode 100. <laughs> uh, but also Utopia did go to war. They just hired other people to do the fighting for them. They hired mercenary armies because they were so wealthy. So it's a hard analogy. I'm all for the idea that Equestria is building alliances out of the goodness of its heart, but I also kind of wish we could have an episode where Equestria has a friendly nation. We need to ask them for something. It's something they have that we don't. We have something we have that they don't. Let's pool our resources as friends would. Mm. I like and, I like your idea and, of Rarity going to find Silk. Yeah. I, 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 I like that idea, actually. I support but, that but, kind of point of view. Right now, I feel like too much positivity is within Equestria, and the rest of the world is ignorant darkness. Well... That's usually what happens when you have a show that has that has pushed the cynicism aside until Meriwether Williams became one of the writers for the show. Mm. Oh, no. Like, no, you know, no, seriously, and I, this is not a criticism to Meriwether Williams. I actually appreciate the writing on some of her episodes 
for bringing a bit more catastrophic kind of like negative side to Equestria, where it is not the the land of happy rainbows that there is. I mean, remember, she's the one that wrote Hearts for Eve. The mm -hmm. one episode that proves how terrible ponies can be to each other mm -hmm. and how you need to put that aside in order to create uh, to create society, to survive, to, to coexist. That was a very good episode for the contrast between the good and the bad, mm -hmm. showing that ponies do have the potential to be evil as well. Not just the evil, magical, tyrannical, I'm going to be evil because the script is telling me to do that. Mm -hmm. No, it's because I'm evil because the situation is forcing me to be like this, or else I am going to die. That's something that they don't treat enough in this show in later seasons, and that's why I think that too much positivity can end up being um, revolting. You need to balance the positivity with some negativity. I am oh, still that, hoping for... Oh, sorry, go ahead. But then that, again, ties into my criticism. We have too much positivity in that Equestria has all the strength. And I'd like to see just a little more balancing of each nation has something to contribute as an individual contributes to a friendship. Well, we'll just have to wait and see what they have for the future. I'm not saying you're wrong. I am on your boat. I completely agree with you on that. Is that it doesn't bother me as much as it should, although it should bother me. There is so much story and so much goodness coming out of this episode, but we are still hindered by the, by the overwhelming, oh my god, Equestria is so good, we have all the cool stuff and you guys have nothing, kind of thing that has been going on since episode one. I do also want to point out a concern for the future. Because we've been here before. Oh. Not here, Griffinstone here, but here, this situation here. You hear? Mm -hmm. here, here, here. here, here. Thank you. Crystal Empire. A nation that was, had lost a lot of itself. The ponies came, helped out. One individual was stayed behind to guide them back. What have we done with the Crystal Empire since then? The Equestria Games, which could theoretically have been held anywhere. The Crystal Empire, unfortunately, is lacking in identity in my eyes still. Mm. I really would like to see Gilda send a message to Rainbow, Pinky, or Twilight saying, hey, I need some help, can you come back? And they have to go back and help ease some problems. That's that's a great use of uh, Griffinstone as an ex building it up. That no. makes it wor world building rather than a set piece. Here's the thing that I'm thinking of. Okay, that's true. Like Gilda calling the her friends to come out and help with the restoration of Griffinstone. But I would see that as a season six kind of situation. No, well, I'm not against that. I just uh, Crystal Empire was season three. Here we are, season five. Yeah, but probably not I, six. Truly. You know. You know, uh, I will say that if we are ever going to see Griffinstone again, that will be if they turn it into a playset. Mm -hmm. But the Crystal Empire was also a playset. They had the crystal ponies and all that, and the transparent characters and all that cutesy woodsy stuff. They have the crystal wedding, etc., etc., etc. What have they done with it? Nothing. And they have done nothing with it because the sales on those playsets weren't very good. That's why you haven't seen more of the Crystal Empire. And the reason why they went back into the Equestria games and everything, because they already, they had already married to that in season three. Yeah. There was no way for them to say, okay, we're not going to use that. We're going to um, have to, oh, oh yeah, we're going to have uh, the Cuban Crusaders carrying the flag and yeah. we're going to train with the Wonderbolts and blah, blah, blah. And then it all adds for nothing. Hey, it did. Because the toys didn't do all that well. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, come on. On point to what Silver's trying to say here. Yeah, we do need more world building. Because for now, they're introducing a lot of worlds. They're introducing Yak Yakistan, uh, Griffinstone, the town, the Equalist that still needs to be mentioned, and other new worlds that will soon be discovered. And some previous one that I want to no more, like Saddle Arabia. How's that? Because those are horses. I would like to see Saddle Arabia. Yeah, so I mean, I want to know more because world building and stuff. 
And like I mentioned before, I don't mind all this coming in Season 6. They, clearly, they have a theme to be done in Season 5, which is building, uh, mending they bridges two, and whatnot. So, yeah, so they, have that. Theme, they, they have two themes going on Season 5 at the moment. One is mending, bridge, mending fences and rebuilding bridges. And the other theme is kitty marks. Yeah. And what is the meaning of having a cutie mark? Yeah, what so... do you do when you have one? And what is your destiny meant to be and all that? Yeah, they have yeah, two yeah. themes going on season five and so far they managed to keep it focused. Mm-hmm. Well, so with, it's good with better or worse results, but mm, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's that for now, but we'll just have to wait and see what's the result of all that when it comes to the end of the season and season six pops out. Well... We actually went in to talk about something that is theme related that has nothing to do or a slightly little to do with the episode, but I'm glad that we did. Yeah, and in the end, uh, Sugar Cube Corner is not burned down. That's yeah, good. goodness for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we end seeing that Gammy is exactly where Pinkie Pie left him. You know, this could be funny because the end here where Gummy just falls down, it's not the uh, the end of the whole adventure is just Pinky just goes out and Gummy just drops like and then the adventure starts <laughs> <laughs> like think about it that way we got no idea if Sugar Cube Corner is still standing or not let's just hope that the cakes have insurance everything has been set on fire except what what Gummy is touching or looking at ah <laughs> uh, yeah and we're grimdark ah <laughs> uh, no no just comedy. Just comedy. Dark comedy. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we... we Dark well, comedy. <laughs> Dark sketch. Dark sketch. Dark sketch. Dark sketch. Uh, but anywho, final thoughts, guys. Final thoughts. Yeah, let's go for final thoughts on this one. Okay, well, cer- certainly I've raised a lot of questions. This is a fun and enjoyable episode. You get to see Pinky at some of her best and most adorable moments. Rainbow... You flesh out her history. Gilda is a more interesting character because of this episode. And someone who now I wouldn't mind seeing again. She's still not, like, she's no Coco Pamel, I'm just saying. Mm. Uh, but Coco. but she's a lot more likable now than she was. The, the downsides to this is that it sort of raises a question about world building. And that's really, a, that's where all of my criticisms kind of build. What does the map do? Is it destiny or is it setting up for the solution? Not knowing. I don't know. Uh, are we going to see Griffinstone in future seasons? Will it play a role? Is Equestria so perfect in the national sense that it has no need, but it's just doing this out of perfection? Uh, all these things kind of make you wonder. May not be negatives, but I do think they're worth considering. There you go. I'm pretty sure that they will bring, they will address a couple of those questions. I mean, the, this show is too smart to not do something with what they just presented. This, this kingdom has way too much potential to be wasted. Don't do the same with the Crystal Empire, please don't. See, there's my fear. We say this show is, is too smart, but I've seen them leave a couple of things by the wayside so far. Hoping well, they'll pick it up, but I'm hoping. The smart doesn't equal clever. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, as for me, this one is interesting. I, I, at first I was expecting something, like I had preconceived notions, but I was willing to throw them aside because I know those notions will never be filled. And what I got was a really good episode featuring one of, um, one of my favorite characters that hasn't been shown in a long time. And yeah, this episode was awesome. Good action scene, good comedy. The pacing was perfect once again. And well, a few bumps here and there, but hey, it's a 22 minute show. I'm not going to complain, but hey, it's a good show. I like it. You know, I, you pretty much said exactly the same things that I was going to say. You. That's not a word. I mean, come <laughs> on, Norman. <laughs> You're stepping on my turf now. I'm going to have to kill you. Um... This is one episode that when I started reviewing it, when I started talking about it, I thought I was going to change my mind about it because I only watched it once. Uh didn't have the chance to rewatch it or uh, didn't have to like didn't have the drive 
to to watch it again because I was worried I was going to be disappointed by it. I was I was worried I I might have like been watching it with uh, uh, with cl- a clouded opinion. So I was expecting to end the the review thinking differently than the way that I started, but no, I'm still standing by the by by this episode as. Probably one of the most interesting episodes that I have watched in this show, especially when it comes to story and character development. I mean, the fact that it managed to pull off all that lore and all that world building without fighting against the development of Gilda and bringing her back, making her more likable, and turning her into a character of her own instead of like... A, 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 a literary resource that you use to drive a moral po- uh, to drive a moral home. It's wonderful. I mean, the Gilda had no business in coming back in the show. None of this had a business to happen. The the reason why we still have a show is because people were watching it so hard that Hasbro commissioned the eight checks for more seasons after season three ended. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, I am very glad that I watched this episode, and I think it's one of the one of the strongest episodes when it comes to to developing this this crazy crazy land of pastel color horses and many other different species. Mm-hmm. It does have a few bumps in the way, it does have a few problems here and there, but they don't bother me in the slightest. I can still sit and enjoy a uh, really interesting, very I- I- I cr- cram, but doesn't feel like it. Super well paced episode. So yeah, I like it. It falls onto the, onto the good side. It falls into the satisfactory, excellent category. So yeah. Good. Two thumbs up. Yay. So James, next week, what are you going to do? <laughs> oh my gosh. Next yeah. week. <laughs> next week. Guys, we're going to be talking about episode 9 of season 5, overall episode 100, <laughs> titled Slice of Life, written by M.A. Larson. <laughs> what is it going to be about? What's the uh... point of this episode? Will it happen without a certain crazy part of the fandom that just loves to ship everything with everyone? Wow. Well, we I may find out. <laughs> I can't wait to see what Twilight's gonna do! Yay! I cannot wait to see Rarity being involved in the episode, or Applejack <laughs> in her own environment. Oh, party with Pinky! Yay! <laughs> Silva, wanna join in? <laughs> I'm gonna let you two go at this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good grief. But yes, we're going to be reviewing episode 100, guys. The first show in Hasbro's line of shows to reach 100 episodes. Wow. No other show has done this. Not the original MLP, not the original Transformers, not any other show but this one. And to think that this is the show that gets the 100 episodes... It's both hilarious and kind of sad at the same time. Hey, it's not that sad. <laughs> think about Come it. On. Okay, yeah, I'm no, gonna, th- okay, no, I'm no, gonna Norman, save, Norman, I'm gonna Norman, save th- my th- argument for that gonna, later. I'm gonna save, save it. Save, yeah, next yeah. Time. yeah, but you, well, there you, you go. think about it for a moment and then you'll realize that this is the last ep- show that you expect to reach a hundred episodes. Not really, but anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> Usually the shows that don't have an overarching conflict usually reach further because you're not stretching out the conflict. This one, it is slice of life. True that, true that. <laughs> but still, let's keep our opinion for the next time we review because there you go. we, I think we're going to have two hours on that. Like That just, episode is going to be a long one. Yeah, I, I uh, have a feeling. I have a feeling. That tonight's going to gonna you, be a uh, good... No. Well, are you hooked on the feeling? <laughs> yeah. Are you high on believing? <laughs> uh, I forgot the song. But anyhow, James, take us out. Uh, for dinner? Probably. No. Yeah. I can only invite one of you, and I don't love you, Norman, so... <laughs> uh, boo. Uh, he asked me! He asked me! <laughs> no, he didn't. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this one, even though it was really random and all over the place, but it was fun. 
Argentina. So, we will we'll see you next time with more reviewing and with more ponies and with more randomness. Ah, uh, this has been James Cork. And I am Norman Senzo. And I'm part Griffin, part pony, which means I can act like a complete jerk and then be feel really bad about it later. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's okay, Silver. We allow you to do that because we love you. He yeah. asked me! He asked me! <laughs> uh. See you all guys on the on the next NBA show reviews. Have a good one. Bye bye. Adios. Yeah.